do you like it like this or you prefer this? Well, do you get the light from the window? Because if I do this, then if I move, I'll cover the Shostakovich. Who is that? That's Rubinstein next to Shostakovich? Brahms. Yeah. Brahms. But we don't, don't have him. No, you don't okay. have him. He's dead. Yeah. I was a happy child. I was not one of those kids who practiced 10 hours a day. He was such a good, great father that, that that's basically my example, uh, who I should be as a father. And I'm trying to be smart now, right? With this haircut, this coronavirus haircut. So I was already interested in magician things that Naomi was doing. Teaching was always like this. He was kind of crooked, and he was like always saying, "Can you play more simple?" My English is not so good. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Okay. I have a question about uh, your teachers, your two major teachers, Tatiana Zelikman and Lev Naumov. Could you tell us what was something that you learned as a person and as a professional pianist from Tatiana Zelikman, and then what was the change? when you started uh, taking lessons with Lev Naumov, was there something completely new that you discovered uh, uh, studying with Lev Naumov? I was with uh, Tatiana Zelikman, it's, uh, it's, it's so people would understand it's been a uh, special music school where you basically spend entire life. You start at the age of five and then graduate with age, at the age of 18. And that's kind of formula was uh, special even for Russia. Um, there were only eight schools of that kind in that uh, time. And uh, it's like growing up with having a, I don't know, second mother or um, a person who you see twice a week, who is so influential at, uh, on you. Compa in, actually, I would compare it to, you, to your family. It becomes your family. She, uh, and uh, she treated all her students uh, as family and with pros and cons of that, you know. Um, and the sweetest person at the kitchen and probably the scariest person at the piano. Um, I think the major thing that she taught me was this um dedication to the cause and understanding that the bar is set so high so the sense of responsibility that you take uh learning music and uh, working with the piece has to be immense um i was happy child in the sense that i had a very good balance between the school music and let's say uh soccer or football uh, speaking of yeah, European language. Um, I was not. I was not one of those kids who practiced ten hours a day, and nobody ever required that of, that of me. Uh, but I and I again, I had so many interests uh, besides music. I think that we are not only interested in our hearts, but in that we are not as interested in other things. For example, if other kids are interested in playing more, playing на поехать какую на какую туристическую поездку у нас такое очень редко мы гуляем и, без, и чаще всего мы уделяем времени место чтению слушанию музыки to normal class it was very strange because now nobody was telling me what to do 
And that was the first shock when now it's apparently, apparently now you have to come up with many, most of the answers. You are going to be shown the path, the direction, but you have to figure out it yourself. And uh, I remember the first year was very interesting and struggling at the very same time. If, uh, you know, when Naumov died and we, we had lots of um, concerts and presentations in his memory, uh, one of his students, uh, Ivan Sokolov, um, he tried to explain the method, because that was always a question, uh, explaining the method of Lev, Lev Naumov. Um, unfortunately, and unfortunately, I cannot show it in English because it would make no sense, but in Russian, there are a lot of uh, jokes about it, you know, how he's asking you to be simple. And his way of teaching was always like this. He was kind of crooked, and he was like always saying, "Can you play more simple, please?" You know, and um, we were always laughing about it. And it's hard to really pronounce, v verbalize his method, but it was all about imagination. It was all about the almost theatrical uh, feeling of music. Uh, he would always conduct. He would always lead you in some sort of a. Um, different dimension, there would be constant uh, referrals to poetry, to literature, to paintings, to, you know, it's, it's all this big background. Она бреющем полете, пытается долететь. И вот это вот какое-то страдание, очень сильное впечатление. But, um, interesting enough, uh, to sort of, for me, everything became very clear the very last lesson, because I was his last, last student and I, I saw him last before I went for Clyburn. And um, in our very last lesson, uh, I, for some, I don't know why, but I brought him a piece which I was not supposed to play the Clyburn. It was Schumann Kinderstern. And what was great about Nomov is that, you know, he he had 100,000 trillion students, you know, and he heard every piece 10,000 times. But what was great about it is about him, when he would open the score in front of you, it seemed like he saw it maybe for the second time in his life. Uh, he was so fascinated with everything what he saw. and. Uh, he opened the score and, and he said, you know, he said, music, before we open the score, the music is perfect. Once we open the score, uh, we start spoiling it. So let's try to spoil it as less as possible. I wanted to talk to you about teaching. Uh, I've been sort of following your career and it seems like teaching plays a pretty large role in your life. And you started teaching when you were, I think, 23, this is what I read, in a, at the Gnesin Academy. Um, then came the Columbus State University, New York University after you moved here, and now you're at the Eastman School. Um, can you tell me uh, something about your um, teaching, uh, your experience as a teacher, uh, was it uh, a necessity or is it a passion of yours? You know, it started uh, obviously, and it is uh, a passion because uh, I graduated from uh, Moscow Conservatory and uh, that year, Tatiana Zelikman, she was appointed a full-time 
professor at Nesson Academy. And I went to her, I said, do you need an assistant? And she said, because somehow when I graded, I was already interested in this magician things that Naomi was doing, you know. I, I was taking it as a magic, and, and I was really fascinated. How does it work? It's something I, you have to be on the other side to understand it. Uh, and she said, I would love to have an assistant, but I can't because her rank at that time did not allow her to have an assistant. But she said, my husband, uh, Vladimir Trop, who is a renowned professor, um, a phenomenal pianist, he was without an assistant for a year. And she said, he would love if you come. I entered conservatory doing my master's degree at the same time when I started teaching this in academy. And people were like, what? Why, why are you doing this? And, uh, but the faculty of National Academy, I thought always been not, uh, I mean, as competitive as, as Tchaikovsky Conservatory. I mean, they had, if you think of it, Neuhaus taught there, Naomov taught there, different times, of course, but uh, it's, an, it's an iconic place uh, with lots of history. I started realizing that teaching helps my own playing in the sense that we do a lot of things intuitively. But now I have 18 year old. Now I'm 23, right? And I have the 18 year old. I have to explain to him verbally with words. Uh, things that I would not even bother explaining to myself. And then, of course, as, as being a young teacher, the first mistake I made, I tried to make them play like myself. And uh, then uh, quickly, I realized it's not working. And then I remembered Naomi, who was an excellent psychologist, individualist, you know, who didn't believe the students, you know, there was a human being in front of him and um, with his own ideas. And he respected it so much. And so the responsibility was not to destroy the ideas, but maybe just polish them, you know, uh, shape them. And then when I moved here, I didn't apply for a job. Um, I was kind of enjoying my life as it was. And then I got a phone call about this new school in Columbus State, where a new program. And uh, that was very interesting because they said, well, you can do whatever you want. You can travel. You can, you know, you don't have to have a lot of students and you just like, recruit the students yourself. And there, there's some scholarship for that. And that was a great journey. And I think that was, well, that was absolutely a turning point in my life. Everything uh, really shaped uh, since then. Um, yeah, and Eastman, obviously, the place where um, you have iconic people walking in the corridors and you're like, what am I doing here? Uh, uh, and uh, what's really fascinating about Eastman is that there are special students coming there. Uh, they're very passionate. They're, 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 they're just special. It's a very different kind of students. Um, they're very enthusiastic. They have lots of interests and uh, you, you learn a lot from them, really. Um, very diverse community. I don't have any student in my studio who is from Rochester. And the load is heavy. It's a big university, big program, uh, heavy, heavy classes, uh, theory and music history and all that. And plus piano lessons and they give their best. The curiosity, I think that's the major, the major uh, engine. Uh, if you're curious, then you are gonna get somewhere, I think. And I'm trying to be smart now, right? With this haircut, this coronavirus haircut stuff. Is it homemade? Oh yes, it's very hard. <laughs> and it, it's already it's already long, you know. It's been it's been almost like very little, very very little. Yeah, that's uh, my wife. She just took the razor, and it's all it's been done. We have a guest uh, here today with us, Matthew Cheng, 11-year-old student, a third prize winner of the Kosciuszko Foundation Shopping Competition for Young Pianists. Good morning. Good morning. So happy to, to see you. Um, and uh, we're su super excited to, 
to hear you play. Uh, can you tell us what are you going to play for us? Yeah, okay, I'm going to play the Etude Opus 10, number 8 by Frederick Chopin. Looking forward, please. See, now you understand why we all have to retire. Because uh, when people play like this at the age of 11, you know, that we have nothing to do. Bravo, Matthew, sounded great, really. And I wish you all the best with your, um, with your music. And uh, make sure you play some sports, OK? OK. Yeah, sitting is bad for you. <laughs> Matthew, um, did you prepare any questions for Mr. Cobrin? Yes, I have um, one. So. Um... What do you think Chopin's intention is when he like creates a certain etude? Like, is, does he have what inspires him to make that certain one? Is it for like educational or like entertainment purposes? Well, you know, uh, actually, uh, there is a, lo a lot in your answer already. In your question already, uh, you know, when he wrote first two etudes, he called them exercises, literally. Oh. Yeah, and then he wrote the third one. And then he changed the wording. And so I think in every uh, Chopin piece, you can always, uh, it ha it's, it's a beautiful piece of music. And his etudes uh, are called etudes only because they're difficult. But it's just a difficult way of expressing most beautiful pieces of uh, music imaginable. You know, and uh, of course, his intention was to uh, show off basically, right? Um, uh, I'm not sure he really cared about us playing his music in this sense, he, uh, uh, but it's fun to play and most importantly it's beautiful. And so uh, I think you're treating this piece very nicely this way and always do that. Always uh, see the beauty first and you have great fingers, you have no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Imagine there is no piano competition at all. Uh, 
would you be yourself would you be here how how would you imagine your life uh, without any of the competition i can't tell and uh, that would be pure speculation because uh, we live in such world that um is a constant competition by itself um Again, we're talking about different times. When I was competing, there was no Facebook. At that time, uh, there was no social media. Uh, so people would read newspapers and you know watch. PBS was a, was was like a hit. You know, Medso, all these TV channels. Uh, where where else would you hear uh, music that's been played all over the world, right? Now you don't need any of that. Because you know you have YouTube, you have Facebook Live, everybody live streaming everything they should and they shouldn't, and and all of that. So uh, we'll see where, where this world takes us away from this online way of life, which to me is kind of sad uh, because I I'm very conservative in my beliefs. I believe that there is nothing more, that there's not, nothing could replace the human contact. So. Would I be would I be where I am now? You know, it's all in Torah. It says it's all written, right? So if you take that perspective, eventually, probably I should end up where I am. Stanislav asked you about who would you be or where would you be without competitions. I wanted to ask you about who would you be if not a musician? Oh, it's a great question. Probably historian. Historian? Yeah, my mom is a historian and that was always my passion. In school, it was, uh, I think, number one subject which I admired and uh, I, I was good at it. Uh, and uh, definitely, I would, I would go in that, or an, an actor, which my mom wanted me to be. She, she wanted me to be an actor and she, because she thought that I had all the uh, talent for it because uh, since I was a baby, I would, you know, I would never be Alex, you know, I would be anybody else from all these books and, and fairy tales and, and things like that. And actually, that's my, my, my three-year-old is acting right now exactly the same way. And uh, yeah, probably that too, history, history or acting, yeah. But ultimately, you know, musicians, we are actors. Let me be a philosopher here. Inside music, have you ever thought of um, something else like composing, conducting, maybe jazz? Composing started at the age of seven and ended up pretty much there. Uh, conducting, you know, show me the pianist who never wanted to be a conductor. Come on, people. And uh, what else did you say? Uh, jazz, jazz. I love jazz all my life. My passion. Uh, I always felt shy to improvise. I thought I'm, I'm very bad at it, and my friends told me, "Just you can't be bad in it. You can just just never try it." Uh, I'm too lazy, and I think I'm just uh, I'm just lazy. And and piano. And there is so much more things that I didn't learn yet, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I just, 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 just too lazy. But maybe someday, maybe someday when I will have so much free time, I hope it will ever happen. But if I have some free time, then I will definitely go to conducting. I'll be like those 60 year old you know, students, uh, but that's fine. <laughs> so you have not started conducting? No, no, uh, my, my experience, uh, I tried violin when I was 11. And my problem with that was that I had a perfect pitch. And I couldn't stand what I'm doing uh, on this violin. So it took me about three days to realize that just do the piano. Piano is tuned, you're fine. When we were in Italy and we were on the train and we were talking, you were saying, okay, you need to, you need to conduct. You were telling me, in the you need to conduct, you need to be a conductor. And uh, I'm, I'm going to, soon I'm going to, I'm going to study conducting in Italy. You were telling so this is what stayed with me. So I actually did study conducting, but you were the person who, who made me think that I should conduct. How did you your parents' 
очень хорошо, как всегда. Все мои успехи они воспринимают хорошо. А неудачи как? Бывают? Ну, неудачи тоже своеобразные. times you already mentioned your parents. I wanted to talk to you about your parents' uh, influence on you um, and what role they played in forming you as a musician. My dad, who is a piano teacher, and he's a director of school of music, but on top of it, he's he was teaching kids all his life. And so he was so good at it, and he knew child psychology, and he never forced me. He never uh, forced me to play. I when I was a, uh, maybe in my first, second grade, I would practice maybe an hour, an hour and a half a day. And my mom, who heard all these stories about how children, other children, are practicing, I'm like, sure you're doing the right thing. I mean, are you sure it's it's enough. I said, yeah, that's all it takes. I mean, I want to I want to make sure he plays outside. You know, and he he gets some fresh air. And and my mom, she was. Um, she, as I said, she was a historian. She, she is still working at the Kremlin Museum. And uh, she opened a vast of, um, information for me in this sense, um, in terms of uh, history, history influence, and really, uh, you know, getting me hooked on it. But they're both very loving parents and um, very supportive. I think I wouldn't go through... Uh, the school without support of my father, because there was a moment when I came to him and I said, I quit and I'm not going back there anymore. And uh, it took him, uh, you know, he hated, he hated uh, calling professors, you know, he I talking about it. He, he would put all his trust in this, but that time he did. And I think that saved the day. Um, and uh, yeah, he's he's been a great friend. And that's that's also uh, he he was such a good great father that that that's basically my example uh, who I should be as a father for my kids you know uh, because he I think I, I just don't see any failures any I think he was a perfect perfect dad in all possible ways. How is Alex coping during the quarantine? Do you still practice regularly? That's the best thing about it. So now I can practice more. That's so wonderful. Last time you touched the piano, what was the piece? Last time I touched the piano was uh, Hammer Clavier. I'm learning it now. Mm -hmm. How is it going? It's Hammer Clavier. Can you tell us about Alex Cobring, the family man? Uh, kids are very confused why Papa is spending so much at home. Uh, it's not something is not right. Why are you? When are you leaving? I'm I'm getting educated by my kids. It's it's wonderful. And I also have a 14 year old who doesn't uh, live live with me, but he is educating me in the best possible way. He's my IT guy. Quarantine morning, coffee or tea? Coffee, coffee. Quarantine evening, a glass of wine or a shot of vodka. Quarantine evening teaching students in upside down time zone. That's what it is. The most stupid question a musician Oops. can be asked in an interview. What is your favorite composer? What's Alex Cobrin recipe to stay positive? To stay positive? Hmm. It's funny because I'm the most paranoid and, uh, and worrying person. I can be very ridiculously funny and, and, and stupid and say, you know, uh, have kids. You know, that'll, that'll keep you positive. And of course, if you're a musician, then uh, practice. The most uh, memorable failure on stage? The most memorable failure on stage? I tell you, uh, 1999, uh, Buzoni competition, uh, concerto, Chopin E minor, orchestra is modulating into F sharp minor, I'm keeping in E major. That's... It's because you're so positive, that's why. Uh, of course. <laughs> what is the first thing you will do after the isolation is over? Is there something you're missing right now in your life that you can't do? 
Uh, probably I will go and shake hands. the episode yet another fabulous journey and this time into your neck of the woods you know all this time during the interview i was thinking he was such a big influence on you yeah in my teens he was one of my biggest influences wow and then years later you get to interview him that's pretty cool yeah it was very special talking to him you know the people and the places he was mentioning i was there i knew the people yeah also matthew what a talent huh absolutely the young artist presentation and the dialogue are my favorite parts of these episodes. Mine too. Well, soon we have another guest. And let's better back up for that one. Seatbelts on. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs>